Okay, so your talk the other day, which was brilliant, uh, it was about atomic clocks. Yes. So mm -hmm. could you tell us why, what happen, why can we use atoms to measure time? What happens inside those atoms that makes that possible? Every atom has certain energy levels. And the thing that's interesting about the way things work in atoms is that the energy levels are very specific. And they're the same for every atom of the same kind. And in order to go from one energy level to another, one of the ways is you put in light or you put in microwaves or radio waves of exactly the right frequency. That's the key. Is that in order to go from one uh, energy level to another, you have to put in just the right frequency. For the kind of atomic clocks that are used to define what we mean by time, what we mean by a second, um, the energy level has to do with um, the change in the orientation of the spin of the nucleus and the electron. So if this is the nucleus of the atom and it's spinning in a certain direction, this is the electron that's going around the atom and it's spinning in a certain direction, to flip that spin, I need to put in uh, microwave radiation at a certain frequency. It's a very specific frequency. And in the case of cesium atoms, uh, we actually define what that frequency is, and that's a way of defining what we mean by a second. It's about 9.2 uh, gigahertz, 9.2 billion uh, cycles per second, and, uh, uh, and that's what we mean by a second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, how, why are all atoms the same? Well, that's a really good question. Um, it's a deeply um, quantum mechanical Uh, feature of uh, of atoms, and in fact, people have done tests to find out whether it's really true, and uh, and we find that it really is true uh, by looking at lots of different atoms and seeing whether they're absolutely identical. But more importantly, there's a feature of uh, of quantum mechanics that has to do with the symmetry of um, the description of. Uh, of atoms or any other particles of the same kind. And by looking at uh, those symmetry properties, we can tell very precisely whether or not these, uh, these atoms are absolutely identical. And as far as we've ever been able to determine, they are. <laughs> Great. Um, so, now, <clears throat> so now you've defined a second in terms of the oscillations associated to the cesium yeah. atom. Now, there is a problem because you need to cool those atoms down Why yes. is that? Well, the faster the atoms are going, the harder it is to measure them. It's perhaps obvious that if something is moving through your apparatus really fast, for one thing, it doesn't stay very long in the apparatus, and it's not so easy to measure something when you don't have a long time to measure it. But the other thing is that there are shifts in the frequency. The familiar Doppler shift, the thing that you um, experience when you... Um, Uh, here, for example, the horn of a car that's coming toward you, the horn sounds at a higher pitch. And when the car is moving away, it's a lower pitch. The same thing happens with the atoms. Uh, their um, uh, oscillation frequency appears higher if it's moving toward you and lower if it's moving away from you. Well, we can't tolerate that. So one of the ways of taking care of that is to make the atoms go more slowly. And there is a This is where laser cooling comes in. How does that work? What is the idea? Yeah, so, so we cool the atoms with lasers, which sounds like a crazy idea, because um, uh, typically when we shine light on something, it gets hot uh, rather than getting cold. But the thing to remember is that the idea of temperature uh, has to do with the motion of the atoms and molecules that make up whatever it is we're measuring The temperature of. If we have a gas, which is what we deal with in my laboratory, it means you have atoms going every which way, and we can shine light on the atoms, and the light pushes on the atoms in such a way as to make them slow down. Now, you might say, well, why doesn't it push on the atoms to make them speed up? And that's the trick. Uh, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the clever trick that came from the, the people who came up with the idea of laser cooling back in 1975, and we've been using that trick ever since. So the trick is to line up the light that you shine and the motion of the atoms correctly so that you do actually slow them down rather than... 
kind of randomly making them yeah. bonds on. Well, it's more than just lining up the light with the atoms, because the problem is that the atoms are going every direction, and the laser beams come in from one direction or maybe from several, but there wouldn't be any way, if that's all there was to the problem, of guaranteeing that atoms absorb light in such a way as to slow down. See, if an atom is going this way and the light's going that way, then the atom will slow down. But if the atom is going that way and the light's going that way, then the atom will speed up. So what we do is tune the frequency of the light so it is a little bit lower than that exact frequency that the atoms like to absorb. So if the atom were at rest, that would mean that the atom wouldn't absorb the light very much. But when the atom is moving, there's a Doppler shift that makes it appear to the atom as if the light that is shining on it has a higher frequency which is to say closer to the frequency that it wants to absorb. So an atom going this way is going to absorb the light. But if the atom is going that way, the Doppler shift is in the opposite direction. And so the atom will not absorb the light very much when it's going that way, which means it won't speed up very much. It'll slow down a lot going this way and only speed up a little bit going that way. That's very clever. <laughs> I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well... How cold can you get the atoms? Well, by laser cooling, we have been able to get cesium atoms, the ones that we use to, uh, to keep time, to just a little bit lower than one millionth of a degree above absolute zero. That's very cold. It is very cold. <laughs> but that's really just the beginning. Using other tricks, we've been able to get the temperature down to a about one billionth of a degree, 10 to the minus 9 degrees above absolute zero. That's mad. And mm -hmm. how accurate are the best atomic clocks and why do we need that accuracy? So the best atomic clocks that are what we call primary standards, that is atomic clocks that really keep time according to the definition of the second, are ones that use cesium. And the best of those clocks are good to about a part in 10 to the 16. We have clocks that are even better than that, but they're not cesium. So eventually we may change the definition of the second to take advantage of these better clocks. Well, what are they used for? Well, uh, really good atomic clocks are used in the global positioning system. But the ones that are in the satellites of the global positioning system are not laser-cooled clocks, or at least not yet. But they're controlled from the ground by laser-cooled clocks. And it's really convenient to have clocks on the ground that you really don't have to worry about. They're just so good. Uh, so that's a practical way in which atomic clocks are used. But there are scientific uh, applications of atomic clocks as well. We use them to study really fundamental questions like is Einstein's theory of uh, gravity, the theory of general relativity, is that correct? Um, uh, are the constants of nature really constant? These are some of the scientific questions, very fundamental questions, that we can explore using really good atomic clocks. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome.